today we are continuing the Facing the Giants series, mini-series. Last week's Facing the Giants happens in the battlefield when David killed the giant Goliath. Today's Facing the Giant happens after David killed the giant and facing another giant, and his name is Saul. Last week's story is a heart-pumping five seconds that culminates in the victory. Today's story is a depressing 13 years that David ran for his life, ran away from Saul's pursuit to kill him. It's during this running that David wrote the psalm that James just led us to read. And he, write down, he wrote down, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Do you feel that your spiritual journey has taken you to a point that you feel is hopeless? And, and you constantly feel stressed out and wanted to quit? An obstacle seems to be bigger than your courage then today's message is for you. Today we are going to explore one simple topic. Why does God allow turmoil in our lives? Why does God allow turmoil in our lives? When David was anointed a king, he was just a king. The historian said he was just 17 years old. When David became king of Israel, he was 13, he was 30 years old. So in between the anointment and his becoming the official king of Israel, there's 13 year gap. Why does God allow such a long time for David to run, not only to wait, but also to run for his life. Why does God have to allow such a turmoil in David's life? Today's psalm has a prelude. Let me just walk you through the prelude, how this psalm came about. So when David was anointed, he was just a king. And Saul, on the other hand, is a grown-up. And Saul also is a head taller above everybody else in Israel, according to the scripture. So Saul was a giant. And when David was anointed, and David was quite a musician, and at that time, the spirit of the Lord already departed from Saul. So Saul become a cycle. He almost like a schizophrenic. He was insane. So the, David has to play hard to comfort Saul. And then at the one point, so after David killed Goliath, so that's the last, so this is Samuel anoints David. And then David played hard for Saul. That's actually before even David become famous when he killed Goliath. Then, the last week's story, David killed Goliath in the battlefield. So after the battle, the Israelites were seen. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And Saul becomes very angry. He said, if they have credit David with tens of thousands, but me only thousands, what more can he get but the kingdom? So Saul feel, felt the threat from David about his kingship. So Saul, from that point on, wanted to kill David. So when at one time, when David was playing hard to comfort him, he hurled a spear 
That's David saying, I'm going to pin David to the wall. He wants to kill David. But David escaped. And then Saul was trying to find other opportunities to kill David. He was saying, okay, I'm going to give my daughter uh, David um, to you as uh, your wife. And then, but you have to kill 100 Philistines. And then David is like, okay. So he killed 200 Philistines and, uh, um, instead of being killed by Philistines. And then Saul's daughter, Michael, fell in love with David and he, they got married. Then, at this point, the, uh, David was playing harp again for Saul. And Saul, once again, was trying to pin David to the wall. And then he ran away and went to his home. And then his wife, Saul's daughter, Michael, said, Okay, you, you got to run. This evening, all the armies of uh, the guards of Saul is going to come to our home to kill you. And so he let David off the window, and David ran, and then they put an idol on in the bed and they put some like a goat's egg, uh, hair on the idol so pretend there's somebody there so the couple of days uh, passed and then those scars came once twice and then finally they kind of flip open the and, and to see who's there and then and David has has been gone and then people uh, saw asked Michael which is the uh, his daughter, why did you let David go? And Michael come up with some reason. But it suffice to say, Saul was trying to kill David. So during this time, Saul's son, Jonathan, developed a great kindred uh, friendship with David. But, but Jonathan cannot believe his father Saul was going to kill David. So he and David come up with a test to see whether Saul was truly going to kill David. So during the, a banquet, David was absent for a couple of days. And then the, Jonathan was uh, trying to cover for David. But eventually, Saul is like, where is David? And Jonathan is like, I let him go to um, some places because he said he has to go. And then Saul becomes so angry with Jonathan that he hurled his spear at Jonathan, his own son, tried to kill Jonathan. And Jonathan knew Saul was indeed trying to kill David. And so they had this uh, arrangement so that because they cannot see each other, and so they... Um, Jonathan will just shoot some arrows and David will look at them and they have some kind of code. If Jonathan say, hey, run, and the, then David would know that Saul was going to kill David. And indeed, so after Jonathan was almost killed by his own father, he knew Saul was insane. He, Saul was going to kill David. So he went to the field with this, uh, his uh, um, his guard, his boy, and then he shoot arrows and to say, hey, run. And then David knew that Jonathan knew that Saul is going to kill David. And so David started his flee for life from that point on. And from that point on, it lasted almost like 10 years. David ran for his life. And that's where today's story started, where the song started. So the first stop David stopped was this town called Nob. So you see, David is a man of God. He knew of one place that is safe. That's the temple of God. So he ran to the priest with nobody around him. He just alone by himself and to get some food. So the priest gave him some food. And then 
also the priests give him the sword because uh, David has no weapon around uh, with him. And so the priest said the sword used by the Goliath was actually stored in his place. And then David is like, there's none like it, give it to me. So David grabbed the sword of Goliath from the city of Nob, Nob and start to his kind of run for his life. And then what amazed me is his next move. He went to the city of Gath. So there's the five fortified cities of the Philistines. And Gath is near Nob. But I would think that's the last place he wanted to go. You know where the, the giant Goliath came from? From Gath. And if, if you, among all the people who hate David most, other than Saul, and it would be the people of Gath. And this illustrates how desperate David's situation was. He literally has nowhere to go. And this place seems to be the best place in his judgment, Gath. But I couldn't understand why he would take Goliath's sword with him. I can just imagine, like he marched toward the city gate, and the guards will look at him and look at the, the sword, even though they may, be, may not recognize the David, per, his person, but they recognize Goliath's sword because it, it's one of his own. And then they look at David, and suddenly they connect the dots. And at the city gate, and those guards were saying, isn't this David, 1 Samuel 21, 11, if you want to go to that part of the scripture. Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the, only, the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And I can only imagine what kind of, uh, kind of emotion would rush through David's mind and heart. It was like, okay, I'm going to get through the city gate and uh, nobody saw me. But he's carrying this giant sword on his back. And then when the guards are saying, oh, isn't this David? The king of the land. And David is like, uh oh. Whoops. Why did I carry this giant sword on my back? But nonetheless, he cannot turn back. Because A, he has no better place to go. Otherwise, he would not go there. And B, if he turned back at that point, the Philistines will chase after him anyway. They would kill him. David was a very afraid, if you look at 1 Samuel 21, 12. He knew he was about to die. He knew he was about to die, and he has no other way. He was desperate. He has no place to go. His own country was persecuting him. His own king was trying to kill him. And he went to the priest, and the priest gave him some consecrated bread, and but they cannot like, take him forever. So he has to leave. Otherwise, he would jeopardize the life of that priest. And later on, that priest's household was killed because of David. Anyway. But that's another story. And then he went on and to go, and he has no work to go but the Gath, city of Gath. David was desperate. I don't know what kind of situation you are in. I would imagine David's situation is 100 times worse. He has everybody departed from him. When he went to the priest, he has all, he has nobody. And the priest was trembling and said, hey David, where are your people? Why are you all by yourself? And that, at that time, David prayed. It was recorded in today's key scripture. 
verse 4 through 7. I saw the Lord, He answered me. This poor man, verse 6, this poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He prayed. I don't think he has much time to pray, but he prayed earnestly. He was desperate. And then, after he, his prayer, he did something remarkable. He pretended to be insane. And I guess he may have a good model, which is Saul. So he knew what the insane person is. And he pretended to be insane. He was marking, the, basically vandalized the, the city gate of uh, Gath. He was making marks on the doors of the city gate. And making, like, letting saliva run down his beard. And I'm trying to re imagine what went through David's mind when he pretended to be insane. He was probably very hungry and very thirsty. But he has no time to think about food or drink. He can only think about his life is in danger. And let saliva run down his beard is the great humiliation for the grown-ups at that time. And nobody was with him. Nobody can help him. And then come back to today's the questions we ask. Why does God allow turmoil in our lives? And I was think God allows turmoil to happen so that we have no other resources to lean on other than Him and Him alone. God wants to demonstrate He Himself alone can deliver us. So if you look back, God answered David's prayer. You may think that's just a story that the king, oh, at that time, of the, when the song started, it says this name, Abimelech. Abimelech is basically is a, the title of king. It's almost like president. The president has a name, and his name is Akish. So Abimelech, Akish, which is the king of Gath at that time, somehow think David was truly insane. Because he has the power to kill David. But somehow, by supernatural, divine intervention, Abimelech, Akish, think, thought David was insane and let him go. He was like so tired of David, saying, Hey, you guys, why did you guys place this madman in front of me? Do I not have enough madman in front of me? So he drove, him man, drove David away. To us, it's just a story. It's another story. But to David, he was, his life was on the line. Nobody was there to help him. And he's surrounded by enemies. And he has no other hope but the Almighty God. And he knew his life was in danger. And he saw that God delivered him. And he wrote down this, Taste and see that the Lord is good. It will be another ten years or so that David has to live in exile, running from places to places from Saul's pursuit. And even at one point, went back to the city of Gath and lived there for a year and a half and to hide from Saul. It suffice to say, David's misery continued for 10 plus years. 
Why does God allow so much pain in David's life? Even though he was anointed king very early on. When I was look at David's life, and this 10 plus years prepared David to be a great king who will reign in Israel and make Israel a kingdom of power and wealth. And this 10 plus years polish David's character. And this experience let David see God's love and mercy. God allowed turmoil in our lives for us to experience His love and mercy. Last week, Brother Wu Wei said, he quoted Jesus saying, I have told you those things so that in, may, in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And in James 1-2, it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and that perseverance finishes the work, so you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In all the success stories, you will find turmoil behind the success. In all the successful people, you will, you will find the turmoil history. Who actually over, eventually overcame those turmoils and prevailed. In, in the face of uh, turmoil and calamities, David did not quit. He did not complain. He did not blame God. He prayed. And this kind of example can be found in our days too. So how many of you like this restaurant? And this restaurant generates more revenue per restaurant than any other fast food chain. Number one. And it's only open six days a week. It's closed on Sundays to observe the Lord's Day. And this restaurant oftentimes ranks number one in the customer service. But their success started with a very humble beginning. And this gentleman, Chouette, Kathy, his family struggled even to make a living. When Truett was a kid, his family has to take orders to make ends meet, meaning they will take strangers from the street to live in their home so that they can make ends meet. Oftentimes, their one single bathroom house will have seven borders meaning the people who take lodge. And then, Truett has two brothers, so three sons, four sisters, and two parents. So you can imagine, their single bathroom house is like a slum. And Truett said, I quote, growing up, in the boarding house introduced me to hard work and taught me the value of diligent labor. I learned to shuck corn, shell peas, wash dirty dishes, set the table, shop for my mom, and even flip eggs and pancakes on the grill. So he started to work from very early on. And he and his brother Ben started the first kind of restaurant called Dorf Grill. I think you can see a little bit here. That's the first restaurant. But it was actually profitable. 
but a tragedy hit. Bands, kind of, they were riding, and uh, another brother of the uh, Trads were riding on a private plane, and a private plane crashed, crashed and killed Ben and another brother. So now he has only one person to work with this kind of, uh, to manage this restaurant. And then, soon after, at that time, they have two restaurants, Dorf Grill and I think Dorf Lodge, Dorf House. Then the, another restaurant caught fire and it burned it down to the, to the ground. And to make things worse, they have no insurance. So now, what I was saying was remembering, without adequate insurance to rebuild the restaurant, I faced some tough questions. Do I just quit? Or do I just stay with this one restaurant? Or do I just start something new? Then he starts something new. And that's a starting point of Chick-fil-A. He did not quit in the face of turmoil and those calamities and those trials. And later on, one of his value that makes Chick-fil-A such a great restaurant is invest in the employees, regardless of whether they want to develop a career in fast food or not. So that he values people. So Truett Cathy did not quit and make the history of Chick-fil-A, which is still continues. And I love going to um, Chick-fil-A myself. And another person, how many of you know this guy? And if you watch football and you flip on the TV uh, like on Sunday afternoon, evening, he will be there. He's a football analyst. Tony Dungy is the first African American coach who led a team to win the Super Bowl. He also won the Super Bowl himself when he played for Steelers. He won, he led Colts to Super Bowl champion in 2008. But that's after a major disaster, which in 2005, Tony Dungy, his then 18-year-old son, James, committed suicide. And he was mourning and in grievance for two years before he came back to Super Bowl, to the football. In 2007, he was invited to give a speech at the Super Bowl dinner. And he gave this speech about James, the son who committed suicide. Is that he was a Christian and is today in heaven. He was struggling with the things of the world and took his own life. People ask how I could come back to work so soon. I'm not totally recovered. I don't know I will ever be. It's still ever painful. But some good things have come out of it. And he said, why does God allow pain in our lives? Tanji, uh, Tony Danji asked this emotionally charged question. And he answered himself, because we are loved by God and the pain allows us to head back to our Father. James, after his death, donated, he already donated, uh, signed the organ donation, who is a corona safe, a kind of recover the sites for two individuals. And his story also um, comforted who, those who have a similar tendency and uh, trying to, and Tony was counseling them. And Tony 
was saying, if God had talked to me before James' death and said that his death would help all those people, it would have saved them and healed their sins. I, I would have to say, no, I cannot do that. He continued, but God has the same choice 2,000 years ago with his son, Jesus Christ, and it paved the way for you and me to have eternal life. And that's the benefit I got. And that's the benefit James got, that's the benefits you can get. He was making an altar call at the Super Bowl dinner to the Super Bowl, to the football players, if you accept Jesus into your life as a savior. Tony Dungy prevailed in the face of trials and turmoils. And a year after his speech, he led the Colts, in the Indianapolis Colts, to the Super Bowl champion. Nobody wants trials, neither do I. And I, I grew up with very little trials, and I grew up in a relatively healthy family, and, and study and work are relatively smooth. There's some turmoil. But since 2016, I joined this startup, and then when I first joined this company, it was five people, and today there are 20, 25 people. So it's only like 16 months, and every day there are tons of challenge. Hiring new people, getting new projects, managing existing projects, expanding facilities. Every day is like war. And our church hit a rough patch in 2016 and 2017. And many things need elders to take care. And I was a new elder, and I knew very little. And I made a lot of mistakes as, as the elder. And, and other people pointed out, and I kind of uh, stumbled along. And these two years are filled with like endless meetings and a lot of sleepless nights. And I was thinking back this like past 18 months or so, it's definitely the most difficult time of my life. And this struggle culminates by my passing out in Capitol Hill Baptist Church about, I think, 40 days ago, in, uh, I think in September. And I woke up, thankfully. I have this new appreciation for the time I have, and for the health I have, and for the family and friends I have. It could be I passing out, I will never wake up. But now I could wake up. I did wake up. And now I have this new appreciation for this life I have. I can say for sure, this turmoil has made me stronger as a man, spiritually and emotionally. Physically, I cannot say, because I'm still recovering. But I can definitely say for sure, the turmoil made me a stronger man, emotionally and spiritually. David went through his turmoil at the city of Gath, he was saying, I will proclaim, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory the Lord, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. I know many of the young people in our audience may not have enough, enough experience to taste and see the Lord is good. But remember this, this life is not meant for us to have a smooth ride. This 
life is not meant for us to have a smooth ride. Jesus said, we will have trouble in this world. And God wants us to experience Him in the midst of troubles. Smooth lives cannot produce the results and character God intends. Jesus had the same choice 2,000 some years ago when he decided to take the cross. He had a choice to quit and walk away. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying, Lord, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. But he continued, it's not my will, but your will be done. He chose to obey the Father's will. He chose to suffer. He chose not to quit. So he descended, he was killed and descended into the hell. But God exalted him to the highest place and he gave him the name that is above every name. And that as the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Because of Jesus' suffering, he decides to suffer for you and me. Many of us are in a lot of stress, young and old. It is funny that when, because I reconnected with a few people on the U version, and uh, a lot of people started the plan is like rejoice in suffering or in, among the, the, in stress. And then I oftentimes also come to the kind of explore when I over, feel overwhelmed and when I feel stressed out. I will use God's word to comfort me and to strengthen me. Many of us are in a lot of stress. And that's no surprise. It's a norm. We are in the long haul. And God doesn't mean us to live a smooth and comfortable life. I have a few suggestions when we face the giants the long-haul giants together. First one, don't. Do not quit. It's always the easiest to quit. It's always easiest if we quit and walk away. And I often quit previously. And I change jobs. Because I don't want to face the trials. But thank God, during the last two years, I have no opportunity to quit. Either in church or in my work. I have to face the trials. And through those trials, my characters, I can say for sure, are polished and God is molding me. Kind of destroying the impure things and building up the pure and stronger things through Christ. It's not the results that matters. It's the process that molds us that matters. Second one, do not complain. Complain doesn't help. And every situation is God allowed. If God allows for it, take it. Make best of it. Do's. Do thank God for the trials. Because we are going to be a better person at the end of the tunnel when we walk through the trials. If we persevere and have faith. Second one. Pray and ask for God's deliverance and help. That's the only way we can truly experience God. If we just suffer by ourselves on our own, we suffer in vain. We miss the great opportunity to create this bond, bond with our Creator and our Lord. And He cares for us. So pray and ask for God's deliverance. So if you read today's psalm, 
Verse 6. This poor man called, the Lord heard him, and he saved him all out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Third one, praise God when his help comes. When we praise him, when we worship him, a lot of us may not have enough reason to sing. That's because we have not experienced him personally. But I will tell you for sure, trials will come. During those trial times, do not quit, do not run. Endure with God, endure together with God, experience His goodness and the love and the mercy. So you can, like, like this little child, take it all in, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's great. Our Father in heaven, you are good. You are a good God. You are a merciful God. You want nothing but the best for your people. But in our short-sightedness, oftentimes we want an easy way out. We don't want it to be polished and refined and purified. And Lord, at those times, Lord, I ask you to give courage to this congregation, young and adults. Give us the courage to stick by your side and to sustain those trials and to persevere so that our character can be polished by you, by Christ in us. And Lord, we need your polishing. And we need your refinement. Thank you, Lord. And for those who are in suffering and the trials, Lord, I cry out to you. Lord, hear our cries and deliver us from all the sufferings and the sickness and the struggling we find ourselves in. Hear our cries and reveal your goodness to us and deliver us. We need your deliverance. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.